The views of Central Park are, you know, very, very appealing to foreign buyers. I also think there's a bragging rights component, you know, if you, the, to be able to say that you live on Billionaire's Road, to be able to say that you live in the tallest building or at the highest point in the city, there's a certain cachet that comes with that. This episode of Coffee Talks is brought to you by Markham LLP Accountants and Advisors. Hi, and welcome to another edition of Coffee Talk. Today, we have a very special guest, my former reporter who recently wrote this wonderful book, Billionaires Row, Tycoons, High Rollers, and the Epic Race to Build the World's Most Exclusive Skyscrapers. Kathy Clark is here with us today. Hi, Kathy. Hi. You know, early on in the book, you say that um, Billionaires Row is a physical reminder of the social hierarchy of New York City. What, do you, what did you mean by that? I just mean it's so representative of the enormous degree of wealth that exists in the city and internationally. I mean, folks look up at these buildings from Central Park and sometimes they're empty. Mm -hmm. They, you know, people are spending hundreds of millions of dollars to live there. Um, they're in the middle of the city where, you know, there's a lot of wealth inequality. There's a homeless shelter on that very same street. Um, and it's just a reminder of how much disparity there is. And Billionaire's Row, what we're talking about is the 57th Street corridor of Manhattan. So from 57th Street between, what, Park Avenue to 6th Avenue? Yeah, I, for the purposes of the book, I chose to define it as a series of buildings rather than a specific geographic area. Mm -hmm. So I included 220 Central Park South, Central Park Tower, 157, 111 West 57th Street, and 432 Park. So yeah. just kind of the tallest, most extravagant, most insane buildings. It's funny, you know, I saw these go up one by one. And the first one was 157. And when you saw that, you were like, wow, that really does tower over every other building there. And then the next one went up and it towered over that one. And then the next one towered over that one. And, and now 157 it, looks tiny. It does. It looks like a small one. So who are the key people that you, when you set out to uh, uh, write the book, who are the key people that you said, I have to have these people talk to me? And because like a lot of these guys don't want to talk to reporters, they sort of operate in a vacuum. They're generally private companies. They don't have to mention their losses or their fortune to anybody right so who are the people that you said you had to have in the book right that's what I love about it it's kind of the wild west like these people don't are they're not mostly working for public companies they don't have to report to the SEC they have no corporate flax kind of reining them in so they're so interesting I on my hit list was I really wanted to talk to Gary Barnett which I did Michael Stern Kevin Maloney, Harry Macklow. The real holy grail was Steve Roth from Vornado, but I couldn't get him. Sadly. But all the other ones you mentioned, they spoke to you. Yeah, yeah, they did. Who, by the way, normally don't speak to reporters or authors. I mean, some it required some charm offensive in some, <laughs> in some um, respects, but yeah, and various levels of participation. Some of them sat down with me two or three times and others, you know, were a little bit less accessible. It just depended. What were you surprised by the most as you were writing this book? How it's really not guaranteed that you're going to have financial success when you build one of these. Mm -hmm. Like you are conceiving these projects with absolutely no idea what the market is going to look like when they finally debut. You don't know what interest rates are going to look like. You don't know if the foreign buyers that are active in the market today, if they're going to exist in 10 years time. You don't know what the economy is going to look like, what the political landscape is going to look like. And a lot of these guys did not make any money. I mean, mm -hmm. they they were building on, you know, the idea that foreign buyers were going to remain in the market from Russia and China and the Middle East. And then they woke up, their property was on the market and those those buyers weren't there anymore. Right. Well, Harry uh, Macklow, who's famously known for being the developer of 432 Park, well, he's famously known for a lot of things, but, uh, <laughs> but he's, as far as Billionaire's Row is concerned, he's famously known for 432 Park. But he was also pushed out of that project, but still no, it's still known as Harry Macklow's 432 Park. It's not CIM's 432 Park. Yeah, he, he remained the face of that project for sure. I mean, as the book starts, we're in this, you know, horrible situation and the last financial crisis and he's facing foreclosure on that project and looking across the globe for anyone who's willing to finance it. 
And eventually CIM kind of, you know, bails him out. They effectively buy him out of the project, but they allow him to remain as the developer and the face of it. And he sort of remained intertwined with its entire identity, despite the fact that he didn't have any equity in the residential component. And a lot of people, uh, especially in the industry, they lionize these men. Like no matter what they had to do to get it done, they really admire them and they you know, put them on a pedestal. And some people uh, sort of, uh, you know, picture them as greedy villains who are trying to squeeze every dollar and make New York unaffordable for a lot of people. You know, what was your experience with a lot of these guys? What did you, what did you think motivated them? In some regards, they're so different. Like a Harry Maclow was, he kind of lives like the people he builds for, right? He's very sort of lavish and extravagant and he's, you know, yachting off the coast of Croatia and he's wearing his cravat and his loafers and, you know, Gary Barnett's the complete opposite. He's so, you know, humble and just wants to talk numbers, never wants to talk about himself, very low key in his flip phone and his, you know, novelty ties. But I do think there's some commonality between all of them. Like, who else can go to bed at night with tens of billions of dollars potentially in debt hanging over their heads and still sleep? I think that's what ties them together is just this immunity to the level of stress that other people would completely buckle under. Yeah. And some of these guys are also known to be gifted showmen, you know, and uh, I think that's what it takes to pull some of these deals together. Because like you said, it can take a decade for you to be able to just get the lot to begin the construction part of it and getting the financing part of it. it could, by the time you're done, it could be you're 20 years, 15 years into it, and you don't know how it's going to turn out. You don't know where the market's going to be when you're yeah. ready. The developers are generally known and dropped into three buckets, right? They're either finance guys who normally don't leave their offices. They're looking at Excel sheets all day. They're either marketing guys who are just master marketers or uh, they're construction guys. The folks who are building Billionaire's Row, what do you think, which bucket do you think they fell into? I don't think they fall into any singular bucket. Like if you look at Harry Michael, for instance, that whole marketing campaign for that building was a complete performance on his behalf. Like he's such a showman. If you meet him in person, he's, you know, doing his shtick, his yeah. old Jews telling jokes, jokes, his, you know, he's doing a little dance, doing a little ditty. Um, and I think that's part of what buyers were buying into. You know, you would go to the sales office at the GM building, you would see all his previous works, you would mm -hmm. maybe meet him because he would often be in the office and you'd be very charmed by this like legendary New York developer. And then if you look at the marketing video that they did for that project, it was so unlike anything we'd seen before. They had mm -hmm. Philip Petit walking on a tightrope from the Empire State Building to 432 Park. And they had Harry in a gorilla costume. He was dressed as King Kong. And then at the end, he takes <laughs> And Harry's his like 88 off. years old or something. Something like that. So, yeah. yeah. So he, I mean, it was a complete show for him. But you would never see Gary Barnett do something like that. Right. Yeah. And so you, you found them to be all very different. And the thing that motivated them, you don't think it was just generally money. You think it was more about like, uh, you know, changing the New York City skyline? I think for some of them it's money. I mean, I think for Gary Barnett, he sees his project as a financial engine and you know a mathematical problem to solve. And um, whereas for other developers, like for Harry, I think it was so tied up in his legacy, especially since he didn't have any equity in it. It was tied up more in his identity. And one of the developers said to me at the end of all of this, he said, you know, I didn't make any money on this project, mm -hmm. but I don't see it as a failure because for generations, people are going to look up at the skyline. They're going to see my building and they're going to remember me. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, more important than anything else. You win some, you lose some, but this is going to be here forever. Right. You know, it's funny seeing the amount of money that gets thrown around, not just, you know, f for the developers, but also for the you know, the people who are buying into the units. I mean, some of these units sold for 130, 180 million dollars, right? Some of them uh, were yeah. incredible numbers that it was never domestic, was it? It was always foreigners sort of buying those crazy numbers. I think some of that was a little bit of a misconception. A lot. I mean, these these buildings more than buildings in other neighborhoods in Manhattan definitely attracted a greater level of foreign interest just because that's where foreign buyers want to live. They want to be in Midtown. They want to be at the center of the action. They want a building that looks more like, you know, Dubai than mm -hmm. the West Village. 
But at the same time, some of the major, major deals at these buildings were American buyers. Like oh, really? At 157, the, the biggest buyers were Bill Ackman and Michael Dell. Mm -hmm. And then at 220 Central Park South, the biggest buyer was Ken Griffin. And all of those people are local mm -hmm. and spending hundreds of millions of dollars. So I think it's a little bit of a misconception. I like this story of, uh, you know, assemblage is so key because you need air rights to be able to go as high as you do. And, uh, you know, there's a story where you have somebody buying a building, a little townhouse next to where Harry Mackler wanted to put 432 Park. And Harry had to buy that townhouse to make his building work. And the guy buys the townhouse, I think, for like $8 million. Harry offers him $12 million. And the guy comes back and says, I want $50 million. And Harry tells him, no way, it's not going to happen. And then he finally goes back to him and says, okay, we'll make it work. And then the guy says, actually, I want $100 million. And uh, was there a lot of, like once somebody finds out that you're putting up a $2 billion development, they can pretty much ask you for anything they want and you sort of have to, you know. Yeah, it's a total leverage game. It's That's why you see people like Gary Barnett buying all these properties under really tight LLCs. Mm -hmm. And you know, I remember we used to work with Adam Pincus at The Real Deal and he would sometimes figure out what was happening with an assemblage before it happened and he yeah. would call Gary and Gary would say please don't publish this because once people find out that you are doing this they realize that they can hold you over a barrel for a lot more money than their property is worth and right. it drives up the the price of your your project exponentially um, so it's a really uh, so, so what happened with that did he I forget did he actually end up paying uh, the hundred million dollars for the eight million dollars no property? he didn't it's one of my favorite stories in the book because Harry really really wants that particular property because it meant that he could do a dramatic wall of retail at the base of 432 and he wouldn't have to sort of cut that pro that that building out of his um, out of his envelope. Mm -hmm. um, so he goes to, it was Jacob the jeweler, who's mm -hmm. a really famous celebrity jeweler. Like he's, you know, he provides jewels to Kanye West and Jay Z and right. all these big celebrities. Who's, by the way, also doing his own development in Dubai right yeah, now. Yeah, how bizarre. Um, and so he goes to Jacob and Jacob says, I'll sell it to you for $50 million. They write the terms on a napkin or an envelope or something. And then Harry calls a couple of weeks later when he hasn't heard from him and says, what are we doing here? Are we closing this? What's going on? And he says, actually, I want $100 million. And Harry says, what? Why? Why is that justified? He said, my rabbi <laughs> said I had to ask $100 million. So. Uh, Harry asks for an audience with the rabbi and they end up going to the rabbi's learning center. And so they're all sitting in this room, this dark room with, you know, formica countertops and, you know, linoleum floors or something. And Harry's saying, please sell it to me for $50 million. Be true to your word. And the rabbi says no. Oh, and that was the end of it. <laughs> yeah, that was the end of it. So if you go to the site of 432 now, you can see that there are two properties that are not within the envelope of the building. They look like little cutouts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you at the end of the day, when you look at it, there are cement boxes up in the sky. And the taller they are, the more expensive uh, it gets. It's not that much different from, uh, you know, some of the other really high end, high quality developments that have happened in other parts of the city. What do you think allows them to ask the kind of prices that they ask for just because it's on billionaires row? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I mean, A, the views of Central Park are, you know, very, very appealing to foreign buyers. I also think there's a bragging rights component, you know, if you the, to be able to say that you live on Billionaire's Road, to be able to say that you live in the tallest building or at the highest point in the city, there's a certain cachet that comes with that. But then at the same time, some of these prices haven't held up at all. I mean, if you look at what people are selling at at 157, it's like 30 or 40 percent off sometimes. What Discounted they paid. from what they paid for. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, maybe those prices aren't justified. Right. And the, because also the maintenance and taxes on these buildings are so high too. I remember there was a story where there was a Chinese woman who owned three of the units at 432 or one of the buildings there. And she had gone missing. She had stopped paying her maintenance fees. And the building was like, do we have to put it on? Do we have to put these on auction? What are we going to do with these? And they sort of pulled back from that idea because they thought it would make the building look bad. That right, right. somebody who owns three units is not paying their maintenance uh, bills. What happened with that uh, you know, I think it might still be ongoing, but she wasn't even the only person that disappeared. There was there was a really whole, other people who just disappeared. Yeah, there was a guy um, who bought at 432 Park. I think he bought at the Plaza, and he was in contract to buy a buy a townhouse from Vin Viola, who was um, Trump's um, military secretary or 
um, war secretary or something. And um, he was in contract, he was supposed to close, and then suddenly he just stops answering calls. He just completely disappears off the face of the planet. No one can get in touch with him. And then it turned out that he was one of those, you know, Chinese executives that disappeared and right. potentially ended up in prison. Yeah. And so there were a number of buyers at 157, 432, who just kind of fell off the map. I have a friend who lives at 432 Park, and uh, he said that at any one time, there's probably only like 12 or 18 people who are actually occupying the entire building or 12 or 18 units that are being occupied. The rest of them are uh, sitting empty. And, and do you think that's the case with uh, most of them? I do. At 432 Park, the penthouse is currently on the market for $130 million. And the owner, who's a Saudi retail magnate, has never been there. He's yeah. never spent the, the night Qatari there. The Qatari guy, right? He's, he, uh, he's, he's from Saudi. I think he owns all of the franchises for like Zara and Topshop wow. and, yeah. in the Middle East. And he bought it at a at a record price. He, he's discounting it, actually. He's right? discounting it. He put it on the market. I think it was $169 million. And now it's asking $130, which is still very expensive. And he never lived there. He never lived there. Never spent the night there. And what do you think their motivation is just to park money in the US? I think at some point the way agents have explained it to me is that you reach a certain level of wealth and it becomes it, it's like the way you and I would treat stocks and bonds. It's like if you have a certain amount of money, you want to allocate it to different things. Maybe you want to put some of it in a high interest bank account. Maybe you want to buy some stocks, maybe some, you know, I bonds or something. Mm. And that's the way rich people think of their fortunes. It has to go somewhere. And so they have an allocation for real estate. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really curious about the Steve Roth because he's obviously a commercial landlord. He owns the REIT, uh, Vernado. Uh, and then he decided to do uh, 220 Central Park South, which a lot of people gave him hell for because when the rendering first came out, it was a Robert A.M. Stern uh, building. And uh, it looked exactly like 15 Central yeah, Park it's uh, like West. Yeah, you stretched out It was just stretched out version. He got a lot of slack for that. And uh, he, didn't, he didn't have that kind of experience building, uh, you know, residential condos. But he, for some reason, he chose to do, res this was before commercial is having to deal with the stuff that it has to deal with today. What, you know, what uh, sort of urged him to do a residential building? The way it was explained to me is that he came in and f helped to finance um, a deal with a company that was already in already owned 220 Central Park South. It was Claret Group, which no longer exists. But the site was right opposite his office. So he would mm. sit in his office and look out at it. And he just thought it was the best site in New York. And so it became more of a personal passion project for him mm -hmm. than something that was, you know, really in the wheelhouse of his company. So what do you think is, uh, is there, what's, what do you see for the future of uh, billionaires? Or do you see other buildings on that street trying to compete and trying to be taller and better and grander? I don't think so. Because in this environment, it just doesn't seem like there's enough demand and there's already so much supply like central park tire still has a ton of units to sell as of october of last year they said that 111 west 57th street still wasn't 50 percent sold so there's still a lot of units to be absorbed out of all of the developers it was and was were any of them profitable steve roth was very profitable steve roth was yeah that that building i think he said during covid when you know his office portfolio was really struggling he said Essentially, thank God for 220 Central Park South because it's the engine that's fueling our financial strength. Those closings really were a big boon to their bottom line during the darkest days of the pandemic. Wow. And in, if, in terms of uh, not just the builders, but brokers and architects and even buyers, who are the people off the top of your head that you think define uh, the legacy of Billionaire's Row? I think Gary Barnett is the number one legacy of Billionaires Row because he started it. Mm -hmm. Like back in 2008, there was no Billionaires Row. He was the first person to the party. He was, you know, building at a time when there was almost no financing available. He was going to the Middle East to kind of beg people for more money so he could keep going and people thought he was crazy. Mm -hmm. And then when the market swung back, he was the first to really take advantage of that. And then his second project, sort of the bookend to that cycle, right? Because it kind of shows that the market that he started is not as deep and wide as he had hoped. Right. Well, Kathy, thank you so much for being here today. Kathy's book is available now, Billionaire's Row, highly recommended. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.